Yeah. Okay. So, Viviana, can you come? So we uh, move to the next session on integrated weed management. And uh, Viviane Bilic from Bili, Bili, Germany will be chairing. So yes. Bonjour, Madame and Monsieur. That's about everything I know in French. I'm sorry. So I have to stop here. And I learned that one. My name is Vivian Vivian Fielich. I'm from Germany, from the Federal Office for Agriculture and Food. Some of you may know Annika Fuchs. Um, I took over her project. That's the reason I'm here. Um, the most recent numbers I could find on weeds are from 2014, and they say that estimates are about that 35% of global crop losses are due to weeds. So I guess this is the most important topic of the CIPM conference here because um, it's more than for diseases and insects. Um, our first speaker is um, Arndt Verschwele from the GKI in Germany. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Willich Err. How does it work? Um, good morning, everybody. I try it. Uh, no? Can somebody help me? Ah, here we are. Okay, sorry. Um, good morning, everybody. So everybody had coffee and um, looks good. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, the project is coordinated by my colleague Heidrun Bückmann, and unfortunately, she could not come today, and uh, so I took over her job and uh, will give the presentation. Um, we are talking about decision support system for integrated weed management. Mainly that means um, how can we reduce the herbicide input without uh, losing efficacy. And uh, that's what the topic is here now. Um, you can see here, uh, no, the other way around. Well, I have to learn with it. Uh, we are actually a rather small consortium. You see we are four partners uh, from uh, IPM Consult. is a company, a consulting company from Denmark, actually experts in decision support and in herbicide data. And um, we also have the colleagues from Spain, University of Leidar. And EZIP is a, a German partner who provides a, a platform for IPM in general. So they have uh, many, many uh, forecast systems and decision support systems for diseases and pests. And uh, actually this one would be the first one, or almost the first one, working on herbicides. And we from the JKI, we are the coordinators and we are like our colleagues in Spain doing trials on validation and uh, improvement of the DSS. So we have the technical part which is um, IPM. They are really IT experts, and they have a lot of data, actually a lot of data coming from the Aarhus University. Herr Kutzke is just not here, but he could give a lecture on those response relationships and uh, all these uh, um, factors which are influencing the efficient herbicide dosage. And uh, we take over these experiences and data from mainly coming from Denmark and now working with it in, in Spain and also in Germany. So we started in April 2016, so we will come to an end very soon in March 2019, which means that we have actually uh, finalized our trials in, in the fields and we do some evaluation now and no pair is coming now. I just told that you are the expert of those response relationship and that you could give a lecture here, but I will follow the template and the requirement that I just have 15 minutes here. So Pear, sorry, you cannot, <laughs> but I will show, okay, uh, the background. So as I mentioned, I followed the template which was given here. So there is a high potential for reducing herbicide dosage. You know, we have registered dosages, and uh, the registered dosage is um, actually even efficient under worst case scenarios. So if you have bad conditions for uh, herbicide use, then the registered dose will even work. But we know there are many, many factors and conditions where we can reduce the herbicide dose without losing efficacy. 
The next point is uh, we are working with a target efficacy. A target efficacy means that you do not need 100% control in all cases. So, um, for instance, if you have a low, uh, a low density of wheat, a low wheat competition by, uh, to the crop, then you can reduce uh, the efficacy. You do not need 100%. It can be that in, low, uh, in, in certain cases of a low competition, uh, of wheat, you can reduce the target efficacy, let me say, uh, to up to down to 60%. This is uh, determined by um, experts, so you can change the target efficacy in the system if you are not so risky, for example. It depends on, uh, yeah, you can work risky or more safe. Actually, we are talking about the balance about uh, on safety of a herbicide and uh, the efficacy. So. This is a point where you can reduce the, the dosage if you are able to, to work with low target efficacies. And we have a lot of efficacy data and uh, we have uh, a new technique that means that we have uh, IT technology in the meantime where we can work with all these uh, dose response relationships and all these algorithms um, which can be implemented in the DSS and uh, it is working. Yes, the dose-response re relationship, I think that is the most important point here. And uh, as I mentioned, I, we cannot go into the details, but I can just explain the principle. So we have some dose-response data, mainly coming from the registration process, um, where we have the data package. And uh, it is a requirement by the registration that uh, uh, a company has to provide uh, data on minimum effective dose. So we should have such data, but you see there is a variation, and uh, now again it is a question how safe uh, could it be, and uh, we work with such dose response curves, and um, we have factors which can, uh, let me say, move or shift the curve from the right side to the left, and that means that we can reduce <laughs> the dose without losing efficacy, and as I mentioned, the second point is we can reduce the target efficacy in certain cases, and that means in total we can reduce uh, the dosage of the herbicide. So we have uh, many, many factors like the weed size, the temperature, the humidity of the soil, and the active substance, of course, of the herbicide. All these factors are uh, influencing the, the herbicide dosage, and uh, the DSS can um, calculate the, let me say, the, the optimum of the best combination and the best dosage. And <coughs> the main focus of our DSS uh, project was to, to validate or to, to conduct validation trials in the field and um, to improve the DSS, um, as I mentioned, it, which comes from, from the colleagues from Denmark and Aarhus University, and now it has been improved already also in the a uh, pure project before, and now we are working with um, wheat and maize, that's the main crop. So the main objectives, um, so the new DSS will increase the cost efficiency for herbicide, which is most important or an uh, impor important issue for the farmer. And of course, by reducing the dosage, dosage we also reduce the negative environmental impact. So we have a win-win situation. Uh, economically and uh, environmentally. And um, we also are going to improve the herbicide resistance management. This is always a critical point coming and uh, that uh, companies and farmers and even advisors are saying you cannot reduce the dosage, then you will run in more problems of herbicide resistance. Um, but um, this is not correct because we are actually uh, going for a high efficacy, and the high efficacy is, in sh is important um, for avoiding uh, herbicide resistance that um, is not strictly correlated to, from, to the dosage. Okay, another point is, um, as we are, have implemented this uh, issue target efficacy, that actually is, this, uh, is another way to consider threshold concept, because we are stepwise uh, reducing the, the target efficacy and the dosage, and uh, this is nothing else 
This is the same actually as the threshold concept, so it's uh, implemented in the DSS and uh, also other IPM principles like it is given in the uh, directive of the sustainable use of pesticides like uh, uh, working uh, with mechanical weed control and you should apply herbicide as precisely as possible, you should um, document the or even assess the the, uh, the effect of the herbicide application, all these uh, principles are actually part of the DSS. So, um, and as I told you, we are talking about maize and wheat. So this is just a, a, a short impression how the DSS worked. And uh, this is a template of the, no, it is called IPM-wise, which is coming from uh, our Danish colleagues and it will in a similar way implemented in the ESEP and Germany and the Spanish colleagues have a similar uh, template. So it is, you can see it is asked for the weed species, weed densities, the weather conditions and so on. And um, so the farmer, of course, has to assess the weed population. That is uh, some type of workload. And another work, of course, is putting the data into the uh, into this template and then the DSS will give a recommendation. We have several recommendations of herbicides and combinations uh, and given the price is also given and uh, so that is uh, that is uh, the first job the farmer or the advisor had, had to do and um, as I mentioned we the first and important thing was most important thing in our tribe was to to uh, test the DSS and what we did uh, was to compare the DSS decision with a so-called local standard or uh, a regional standard. So that means uh, what the farmer has decided to spray or advisor has uh, decided to spray on the field and just, this is just an example, you see uh, two or six sites, yeah, we have more than 40 tribes but I just want to show you um, what is uh, about the, the efficacy, the mean efficacy here for, for winter wheat. And you see, we are, uh, in general, we are slightly lower than uh, the efficacy of the local standard. Um, of course, that, that's an important point. Um, but uh, so the, the, dis the difference is not uh, so large. So, um, of course, we have much more tribes and we have to look in details where we have uh, been not so su successful compared to the local standard, but we have also to mention that the local standard is often a routine application and uh, um, yes, actually where we ha often have an overkill effect and uh, um, too much uh, herbicide input and uh, too high efficacy. Um, okay. Uh, the similar was true for maize. Uh, mostly, we were quite good, and it was similar to the local standard, the DSS decision. But if you look at the side B, <coughs> this is a, yeah, a case which should never happen to a farmer. So, if a farmer is in that situation, he probably will never use the DSS again, yeah, and he probably will never. Uh, it's never interesting in using a DSS. So that is uh, a result uh, which is, uh, of course, um, not acceptable. So we have to, and that's what we did. We, we went to, to the data and we looked for certain wheat species, for example, where we could identify that we have calculated with the wrong efficacies. And so the dose response curve was actually not correct. <laughs> And uh, that is our job during, during this project, that we improve the dose-response curve year by year, or you can say trial by trial in, in Denmark, in Spain, and in Germany. And uh, yes, and that's what we have done during the last uh, two years. So this is a trial from 2017. We also did trials in 2018. And um, of course, we have to evaluate the these trials all together. I just want to give you an impression of the results. So another 
result is, uh, as I talk about the target efficacy, we all, of course, want to know, did we meet um, the, the target efficacy in, in the field trial? And this is just an example of uh, five wheat species. Don't care about the name. It uh, doesn't matter here. Just an example. And you see, we dotted the, the observed efficacy against the, the target efficacy, and um, except for viola lenses, um, we actually have always a, a higher efficacy. You cannot say uh, total, uh, maybe it was too much, but we have to find the best profile. So it can be that we uh, can use another herbicide with a um, better profile, but um, this is another important point to compare the observed and the target efficacy. And the most important, or one important thing is to reduce the herbicide dose. Here calculated that the TFI, TFI treatment frequency index means of one that a registered herbicide is uh, applied in the registered dosage. That is a, uh, index one. And if you compare the local standard with the DSS, we can say that in both crops, wheat and maize, we have a reduction of uh, 30 to 30, 40 percent. And um, of course, we also have a big range, a large range, depending on the, the situation on, on the field. But that was a, a general result, so quite promising. So I was asked to tell about the current status of the project. I will go quick, quicker now. Um, so we have all field trials already conducted now. So we have just only six months, four months of the project. We still need some adaptions, some corrections to, um, to, to fit the DSS and to, to make it better. But it's already ready to use in Spain and Germany and Denmark. So we have the platform already. And what we are doing now, we are giving a guidance for resistance, resistance management and the mannequin, mechanical weed control, which is also implemented in the DSS. And we are just working on evaluations and will uh, disseminate the results in the next months until March 2019. And coming now to the research perspective. So in the short, short term, term, we need more validation trials. So there are still some, some mistakes and errors and um, gaps in, in the system, to be honest. And we need an automatic update of national registration data. So we have, have a database where the, the, all the registered herbicides are listed. And of course, we have to be updated in the DSS. At the moment, we, uh, we are doing it by hand. And of course, this is not sustainable. So we need a, this more technical problem to get the data from the registration authority automatically uh, into the DSS. This is working in, in Denmark and partly also in, in Spain, but not really in, in Germany. In the midterm or long term, so we, we should also create a self-learning DSS so that farmers or advisor can improve um, the, the system by putting data in and uh, into the DSS, um, that is just an idea, so we, we have to do it. And we can implement the DSS into a farm management system. That means that we have field uh, and site-specific recommendations and the history and the monitoring automatically. And of course, the wheat assessment is time-consuming and we know we now have automatic systems um, working. Not perfectly, but uh, there is also a lot of research and development ongoing on automatic weed detection. And uh, that is, think, I think, a, a very important point to add it to the DSS. Um, we can easily extrapolate the DSS to other crops as far as we have the, the structure and the IT technique. Of course, we need efficacy data. And the last point, um, we can actually use the DSS also to improve the biodiversity. Let me say that we can design a wheat community. Of course, the main purpose of a farmer is to control uh, the most serious and the most problematic weeds. But actually, we can also use, or we could use, if we have the, the dose response data, we could also 
are, let me say, safe, uh, rare species or even endangered, endangered species, and we can use a DSS for, uh, for having a higher wheat uh, diversity. So um, maybe more a vision than, than a plan, but uh, that's uh, our idea. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Art, for, uh, Art, for your presentation. Um, I would like to ask you to write down the questions you might have so we can have them in the discussion later on. And um, I would uh, like to introduce uh, Maurizio Satin from Italy, and he will present, some, present something about lolium resistance. Yes. How does it work, this? Okay, morning to everyone. Um, I'm Maurizio Satin. I work for the National Research Council in Italy. And I'm coordinating what we call Relium. Apologize for the long title, but sometimes it's like that. I know. It's a herbicide resistance lolium in climatically and agronomically diverse European countries. Uh, we go from uh, Denmark through Italy to Greece. And we go from developing quick and reliable detection tools to devise and sustainable control strategy. Let's hope it goes now. Sorry, how does it work, this? You just did it. Uh, great, thank you very much. <laughs> Relium was selected mm, by the second CIPM call. We addressed the topic B2, pests resistance management, but the project is also relevant for topic A2 and A3. Uh, it lasts three years and it started 1st of July last year, so it will go on until June 2020. Not this one back. Um, Lolium, um, well, we scientists and farmers very well know that Lolium is one of the worst uh, weeds we can get throughout Europe, mainly the central and south, uh, but there are different species. But anyway, uh, in all three countries participating to the project, um, resistant Herbicide resistant populations have been reported and their diffusion is increasing, um, affecting different cropping systems, cereals, vineyards, olive groves, hazelnuts, and conservation agriculture and whatever else. And the species involved are three, rigidum, multiflorum, and perenne. And here's the situation, which is quite interesting, um, because um, oila, um, the three countries had quite different, I would say rather different situations. In Denmark, um, they have multiflorum and perenne in winter cereals, and, that, and that's it. They are good, aren't you, <laughs> um, In Greece, they have a larger variety, but with only lolium rigidum um, involved in winter cereals and in perennial um, crops, vineyards and olive groves. In Italy, uh, we don't miss anything, as you can see. Uh, we have <laughs> uh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> Lolium multiflorum and regionum, we don't have perennial, of course, at least we miss that. Uh, but we have winter cereals, um, we have a couple populations from conservation agriculture, uh, mainly because farmers use um, uh, lolium as a cover crop. So it's like feeding something. You, if you put there billions of seeds and then you select them, you sort of go in trouble. And then we have, of course, vineyards, olive 
growths and hazelnuts. The target <laughs> is volume, of course. The aim is m uh, monitoring and mapping herbicide resistance at national level. This is ambitious. But the this is what we aim to, to develop innovative detection tools and characterizing through different you know, patterns and levels of resistance mechanisms, uh, some selected resistant populations, uh, to devise or update resistance management strategies for lolium in various agronomic situations. And this is the structure of, of the project. It's divided in, in three work package. Um, the uh, first one deals with the, this, there are two tasks with monitoring and mapping. So all countries, all organizations are sampling. I forgot to say the, um, as well as the three uh, officially <coughs> participating organizations. So uh, the matter in Greece, which is an agriculture institute, uh, CNR in Italy, and the Irish University in Denmark. We have two other organizations in Greece that kindly uh, provide their expertise and work uh, at, with no money. <laughs> and we are grateful to them because they cover uh, different uh, aspects and, diff and they have different um, expertise. So all countries will um, monitor, so we'll sample, there will be screenings for resistance, and national uh, database will be set up, and then mapping. And then the, the work package two will deal with resistance mechanisms, starting from defining the resistance pattern as well as level. Um, and we'll go through what is there in terms of target site to ALS and ACCAs, but also to um, glyphosate, we'll see this later, non-target site for ALS, ACCAs and glyphosate, as the last box at the bottom say. At the end, from this data, uh, we, we're starting actually now to work on a, on a diagnostic tool. <laughs> so, uh, this is the, what I just said, plus uh, CNR, so we, Italian partner, provides the know-how and makes our mapping system available uh, to be adapt adapted to Greek and Danish uh, situation. The mapping system actually was published a couple of years, couple of years ago in PLOS. So it's available, it's completely uh, open. Here we are. Uh, the outputs of uh, work package one are these. And what we are quite proud about is that everything will be freely available and regularly adapted, or at least there will be the conditions or the preconditions to do that. And this is the output of what we get uh, from our mapping system. This is the map I sort of extracted last evening, so it's very updated, uh, um, of the uh, situation in Italy about Laudium, uh, countrywide, um, the system is based on totally free software. And the, as you can see, it, it gives you, it's, it's, it's instantaneous, it's very quick. And non, it's based on an underlying database, of course. Um, different colors correspond to uh, different types of resistance. And uh, different um, species. No, I went back, sorry, again. And this is what um, the webmaster, in collaboration, of course, with the Greek and Danish colleagues have, have been doing. This is the sort of structure of the adapted um, application. Uh, 
which we call it IMAR. It's an interactive web-based application for mapping resistance. The whole application is based on free software, free software tools. And the platform has two sections, data management and uh, the mapping system. WP2, determination, first step is to determine the levels and pattern of resistance to ALS and ACCA's inhibitor, and gly as well as glyphosate, uh, for selected multiple resistant populations, because this is the major issues. Many other projects and papers deal with single resistance to one um, mechanism, to one uh, class of herbicides, but we want to go through uh, what's the worst case uh, scenario, so the multiple uh, resistance. And then we go, uh, we are determining the mutations involved in target sites for all the three classes, and then the determination of genes and microRNA responsible for non-target site to the three classes again, this is done by our Danish colleagues. It is quite hot spot in research on resistance at the moment. And then at the end, of course, uh, develop a quick, reliable method to detect target site and non-target site resistance in the field based on loop-mediated isothermal amplification lamp. I'm an agronomist. This is what I know about it. Okay, don't ask me what they do. Uh, and RNA sequence, respectively, of course. And this is what just we go through the dose response. And this is classic. You know, that, that at the back, you have a sort of resistant populations. You have the doses, the increasing doses from left to right. In front of you, there, are, there is a susceptible po population. But what's amazing is this. I move. I have quite a strong voice, so I can do it. It's lovely. <laughs> if you look at this, it's uh, how different situations impact on resistance. We have Denmark here. We have Greece here. And we have Italy there. Instead of cross, we have three herbicides. We have an old FOP with a Claudine FOP. We have a new sort of ACCA, new, new, relatively new, which is penoxidin in the middle. And we have an ALS <coughs> at the end, which is, is a mixture of yogosulfur and mesosulfur. It's incredible, the difference between countries. It is amazing. J just to point out, look, look at the penoxidin in, in, in Denmark. Penoxidin in Denmark is basically not used at field level. <laughs> so look at it. So the, this is. Oh yeah. Why do I touch? Why do I touch? Yeah. This is the field. Those. So most populations, except one, are still susceptible. Uh, both. Especially Greece, that nothing really works. But also in Italy, uh, the situation is. It's not that good, okay? If you look at the old FOP, Greece is like fresh water. <laughs> nothing really, at 10 times the fill dose, nothing happens. Uh, something happens in Italy, not that much. Much more happens again in Denmark. And we could go stay here for a quarter an hour boring you about this, but this is what we are keen in unraveling. So the agronomic background, the agronomic situation, the, of course, the climate and everything else impact heavily on resistance. Resistance in volume is not the same all over Europe. No, wrong one, of course. And we go to target site. This is the CCA, this is the CT domain where the known mutations are. And my colleagues amplified that and whatever else. And this is what we found again. 
Look at the grid. In blue, there are the, the mutations we found. Okay. In black, it means that we did not found any mutation. In red again, what has had been found in Italian, in black, no. In Denmark, no mutations. The same with the LS. That is the uh, part of the gene that has been amplified. Then it's only one mutation, grade two. We don't miss anything as usual. Okay, they are all there. So, the project is halfway through. This is the, the experiment just showed you has been, I, I put the data there two days ago. We finished to collect data about 10, 10 days ago. So we are really going through it. The molecular uh, work has been, is a good point for the target site. It is starting now for the non-target site. And uh, the WP3 is related with building, <coughs> setting up guidelines and uh, dissemination. Of course, scientific papers at the end. Okay. Okay. So that's it. And uh, basically, uh, WP3 will start in a few months. Hasn't started yet. Uh, different work packages uh, work at different times. And all time, we exchange materials. And the same uh, sort of seeds are tested. Same seeds, seeds coming from all over are testing by one lab. So we are exchanging continuously material and complementing each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maurizio. Thank you. You went through it quite quickly. That was good. So we may have uh, time for one or two questions. That might be exciting. <laughs> no, you better stay here. <laughs> Any questions for now? Okay, doesn't look like. So then we, thank you very much again. Um, we um, keep on going, um, talking about, or hearing about biodiversity and weed regulation. And David Bohan from France, kind of France, <laughs> we'll talk about this. <coughs> yeah, I'm kind of France. Uh, I have an English accent, I'm originally from England. Um, right, everyone seems to have problems with this thing. Let's see if I can get it to work. Yeah, so that's the light, that's... Nope. Okay, cool. Um, good morning. Um, today I'd like to introduce you to uh, the work we've been doing within the BioWare project. Um, BioWare is a, an acronym constructed relatively randomly from this, this question. Um, we work in arable agriculture. Um, we're asking the question whether we can actually construct farmer acceptable management that allow us to support uh, seed, weed seed predators to get weed seed regulation as a resilient ecosystem service. And for us, ecosystem service is important. It doesn't just mean ecology. It doesn't mean seed predators eating weed seeds. It means the economy, the, the, the economy behind that and the resilience behind that. So it's, it's, it's if you like, it's uh, uh, economy, ecology, and uh, uh, resilience uh, brought together. So. The BioWare project. We have a number of objectives. Um, we started with some 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 basic ecological objectives. The uh, uh, the the uh, question that that, that that does biodiversity do something? Does the biodiversity of weed seed predators assure assure ensure assure <coughs> weed seed regulation? And behind this idea of the insurance hypothesis is that by having high biodiversity of weed seed predators we always have at least one seed predator that is going to do the job for us, basically. So it's the, the, the idea of the insurance hypothesis. 
We want to understand the effects of infield and landscape management on predator diversity. What by this we actually end up um, being able to move these seed predators around, potentially manage their populations, increase their populations, and potentially push them around landscapes. Um, and a big question that's relative, uh, relevant to, to IPM is whether we can actually offset some of the use of herbicides with these weed seed regulators. To do a socioeconomic valuation of farmer adoption, if, you go, if you're going to do all of this and you want farmers to adopt these practices, you actually under, have to understand why they adopt them, the decisions they make, and so the basic socioeconomic under, underpinning to that. And it's then to work with farmers to actually co-produce or co-create managements that they will find acceptable, that they potentially would adopt and that we can test. So um, coming into the project, there's, there's actually quite a lot of evidence for, for weed seed predation out there. Um, I actually work, and all of the people in the consortium work with, if you can see in the background, this, this black beetle. This is a carabid beetle. It's, this animal is actually Terosticus melanarius. Each of us have our own definition of beauty. Personally, I find this guy quite beautiful. Um, I'll leave you to decide what you think. Um, they're about two centimetres long. They occur in all fields in, 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 in much of uh, Europe. Um, Terosticus melanarius in many parts of Europe is actually the most abundant carabid beetle. And what we have um, in the literature um, is, is quite a lot of evidence that these carabid beetles are associated with changes in weed abundance mediated via seed predation. We've also got quite a lot of evidence in the, the, the literature that, that from molecular trophic analyses of what these guys are eating that, that shows that the carabids feed on weed seeds. For example, we can show that, that approximately 40% of carabids, if you go and actually sort of um, randomly sample them, um, uh, have animal prey in their guts. But when you actually look at how many of them have plant prey in their guts, it's up to 90%. So they're actually using weeds quite a lot weed seeds quite a lot. We have laboratory exp uh, experiments that, that, that show um, using behavioral studies and, and just uh, straightforward presentations in, 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 uh, in uh, cafeteria type tests that these carabids, which carabids eat seeds and um, what they choose. And um, we have field experiments that suggest carabid abundance and diversity can be changed by farmland management. One of the really nice things about projects like C, uh, the, the overarching uh, uh, approaches like CIPM is it allows us to actually choose who we work with. And so what we've done in this project is basically chosen the best people working in each one of these areas to come together in this pro project. Um, luckily, most of them, all, all of them work in Europe. So that's, our, um, that's what we come to the project with. But we also have um, various other bits of lines of uh, newly emerged information since we've actually started the project, one of which comes from a, a sister project in Fache Surplus um, called PRIA. And PRIA is um, a project that's designed to create resilient, in, in the face of climate change, farmer acceptable rotations that actually deliver ecosystem services. It's the idea that actually going forward, we're gonna change our rotations. What we actually wanna do is, is select the rotations that actually will give us the ecosystem services that we want. And in the PREA project, they had access to a large data set from the UK, over 200 fields that had weeds in them. It had all the invertebrates in there. It had the farm management behind, and particularly rotations. And what they did was they set out, build uh, an analysis and a model for this system. And the model's based around a weed model. So it starts with a seed bank at the start of the year. Those seeds germinate and become standing weeds. Those standing weeds then set seed, and that seed then returns to the seed bank. And so across the seed banks, we actually have a change in the size of seed bank. And that tells you something about how much those weed seeds are being regulated. If we drive this down, i.e. the seed bank at the end is smaller, we're doing the job that we want to do. There will be less weed seeds in the future to germinate. 
So that's basically what they did. Um, they did a, a detailed analysis, a structural, this is a structural equation modeling of these 200 fields, in which they actually looked at the impacts of rotations. And so these, these, these boxes up here, it's very difficult to actually explain this. It's merely just to show some of the background that, that comes into the project. These boxes up here are various descriptions of rotations that actually feed into the, 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 the weed life cycle. We also have over here carabid abundance and carabid pressure. Now, carabid abundance is fairly easy to um, estimate. You pit, put pitfall traps out, you catch carabids. But carabid pressure is a different thing. Carabid pressure is each one of the species of carabids that we have in our fields only eats certain seeds or only eats certain types of seeds. And in this data set, we actually don't have the molecular trophic information. So what, we, what was done in the PREA project, it was a, u, uh, using a novel method based on um, uh, energetics, we actually built a seed carabid food web. The idea of the energetic model is very, very simple. Basically, a seed of a certain type can be eaten by a carabid. Sorry, a seed of a certain type and a certain size can be eaten by a carabid of a certain type. Because a carabid actually has to handle the seed, has to play around with it and then eat it, there are certain size efficiencies for carabids of seeds that they can take. And it's purely that. It's the efficiency of handling a seed determines what the carabid can eat. And that goes into the model as carabid pressure. So that, that allows us to take the carabid abundance data we have, feed it through this, and it gives a carabid pressure. And then the upset side of that is that we find that arable rotations affect weed dynamics. Arable rotations also affect the, weed, the, the beetles that we get. The beetles we get tells us something about it, sorry, the diversity or the biodiversity of these beetles. And that determines the biocontrol effect. In fact, for certain rotations, in certain situations, we actually get carabid beetles driving down the seed bank. And so these are the, the major elements of the, um, the BioAware project. We have ar uh, arable rotations, which here is a management. We want to use management. We have changes in, in, in weeds, and we have changes in the biodiversity of the, the weed seed predators that we want to use, and they have an effect on the weed. So, the PREA project, if you like, provides us with, um, if you like, a theoretical framework. It makes a prediction, but it's a prediction that's only relevant for the UK because the data are only from the UK. So when we come into the BioAware project, what we're talking about doing is building a generic picture or a general picture for Europe. So what we've done for the first half of the uh, BioAware project is actually do a large-scale field sampling. The field sampling involves 15 real fields in each of four countries, France, Sweden, Austria, and the Czech Republic. And we follow these fields, we follow the weeds, and we follow the uh, carabids at two sampling points in each one of these fields. Um, the real is quite important because actually to, to actually get these 15 fields, they are real fields, they're not experimental fields. We're actually having to work with farms already. So we're already getting feedback from farmers about whether these are actually realistic things that we're doing. So the way that this starts is we follow the leaf weed life cycle that I had already presented in the, 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 the prayer model. So it goes from the seed bank via standing weeds to seed rain and seed bank again. So we have the seed bank. Before we ever sowed the, the crop, we went into the fields and took a seed bank sample. At the end of the experiment, we took another seed bank sample. And at two sampling points throughout the year, we took standing weeds and seed rain. Actually, the seed rain is taken over at some time. Sampling seed bank, as anyone who's done it knows, is quite, quite labour intensive. This is actually a picture which is not so easy to see, but it's, um, it's basically a lot of pots with soil samples in, in which the, 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 thing, the, the seeds that are in the soil are germinating. We actually count, we, we do this over 18 weeks. So each one of these seed banks takes 18 weeks to actually assess. All the seeds, uh, all the, the, the soil samples are assessed. We, we count the weeds, we identify them to species. So we know, roughly speaking, what's in the seed bank. We trap carabids using pitfall traps. And we also put, push all of the carabids that we sample or, yeah, through molecular trophic analyses. We're interested. Carabids 
are omnivores, generally speaking. Some species are specialists on, on weed seeds, some species, species are specialist predators, but most of them are omnivores. That means that they can be very much dis distracted by alternative prey. Other things that are in the fields, they could potentially eat those rather than the weed seeds. So we're also interested in our alternative prey, and we're doing the molecular trophic analyses also for the alternative prey. And we also have the landscape inputs and rotations. So from this, we'll be able to estimate an agroecological function, which is the change in the seed bank. We'll be able to, um, using the molecular analyses we're going to do on all the carabids, we're going to actually um, uh, test uh, uh, 1,309 carabids, which is just done. We'll be able to tell what the carabids are eating, both in terms of plant, but also in terms of inter uh, invertebrate prey. And I should say at this point, um, this will be, at the end of this, we believe that it will be the most detailed sampling of an agricultural system ever done using molecular things, a carabid-centred uh, uh, sampling using carabid beetles. And so we'll be able to do analysis of carabid diversity and weed seed regulation because we have the measure of the change in the wheat, wheat uh, seed bank. We are able to build food webs and understand whether the structure of the food web and particularly the resilience and robustness of that food web and regulation are related. And we'll be able to understand management effects and how those drive um, changes in regulation. So that's the, the, if you like, the data we're generating in the project. We're also very much using data that already exists. And so in work package two, we're con conducting a meta-analysis of the li literature to understand what people have already done and what management uh, exist out there to answer basically two questions. The first is uh, uh, the question of the relationship between management and abundance and diversity of carabid beetles. And if anyone wants to know about this, this meta-analysis, there's actually Pavel Saskas in the audience who's, who's doing this. We're doing a second related meta-analysis that then takes the carabid abundance and diversity on and says what in the literature what in the literature can we say from sorry, what can we say from the literature about carabid activity density and the removal rates of weed seeds? And we're also going to do, because we have it both in the data we're collecting, in the literature and in the, the large-scale um, uh, field uh, data from the UK, the 200 fields um, from the UK, a relationship between herbicide use and carabids. So we'll be able to play around with, with, with all those three, three, three elements. So um, if we're going to start taking this to farmers, I've got to hurry up, haven't I? If we're going to take this to farmers, we've actually got to start convincing them to adopt it. Farmers, uh, farmer practice, changing farmer practice takes time, money. It's, m it's basically money. And so what we want to understand is what farmer willingness to pay to adopt IPM. What, what are the levers that we can use to help farmers adopt this stuff? Willingness to pay is just another way of saying that the farmer might be willing to pay or we as a society might be willing to pay for them to get to adopt. So we need to understand this. So what we've recently done is launched uh, what's called a discrete choice experiment, an online discrete choice experiment for farmers in France and in Austria. And a discrete choice experiment is a very, is an experiment. It's, it's not like most socioeconomic um, uh, interactions or many socioeconomic interactions where we, we just go and talk to farmers. This we're actually using farmers as an experimental animal, for want of a better way of putting it. So this starts by us getting um, 20 farmers together um, in a room, and we ask them, we provide them with a question. OK, why would you adopt IPM practices? And they start to actually list the things that they think are important. And these are the attributes. So this might be impact on your um, revenue, um, impact on the environment, um, the, 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 your, your spread of work, um, the, 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 the time it takes to transition to this new management. And, and whether there is actually a structure around you to help you um, make this move. We then ask them to give us descriptions for these so that we actually define what this, this means and what they think this means. And we also talk about, we talk to them to try and get them to actually define potential levels. Now, when we talk to farmers, it becomes very difficult to get large numbers of them. They are required to do lots of things. So what we've got to use this, this information quite effectively. 
So we actually put it into what's a, a type of an econometric model, which actually gen generates from this different types of scenarios of adoption. And this is one of the scenarios of adoption. So again, we have the attributes down here, the impacts you're the, uh, on the uh, revenue, environment, uh, organization of work, um, the duration of a transition, and um, whether there are frameworks. And there is always, in one of these scenarios, a status quo, so something that is not changed. But there are alternatives, and these attributes can change. And what we're basically asking farmers to do is to check one of these, decide which one they would like to adopt. Sorry, I'm going to go back. And by doing this, and each farmer is presented with six of these in series, we get data in the same way that you get data in an experiment. And that's why it's a discrete choice experiment. They're presented with discrete choices and they can select. There is then an economic, an econometric model behind that is based on the status quo. And what that allows us to do is based on some of the understandings of the economics of the status quo, we can estimate how much it would cost to, we would be required to pay farmers to adopt different combinations of these scenarios. And so we start to understand something about the money, the support that might be necessary to, pay, to, to provide farmers with that. We also can start to prioritise the attributes. So uh, that's, the, that's just the website. The way this works is that we then take the results of this, we kidnap a load of farmers, we put them in a room, we give them tea and coffee and cakes, we lock the doors, and we say to them, there is a target for this focus group. At the end of this focus group, we want from you an acceptable to you management that incorporates carabids. And we provide them with the ecological regulation information that we're going to discover in the project. We provide them with information about biodiversity and resilience. We provide them information about the practices that we think work on the carabids. And we provide them information about the willingness to pay, so this, this, this economic. And it's this way that we actually start to build together the, 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 the economic, the social, and the, uh, uh, the ecological, and the resilience type work that's interesting to us. OK. So transfer and perspectives. For farmers, really, the need is for acceptable practice. That means it needs to be integrated with their current management. It needs to be low risk, by which I mean ecologically resilient. It needs to be at acceptable cost or through, via willingness to pay, supported. That's what we're trying to do in this project. They're key. And the last part of the project is particularly going to be orientated towards this. But anything that they come up with in these focus groups, we need to test. It might look like an acceptable practice, but we need to verify if it works. So in the project, if we can find managements that work over the appropriate timescale, the aim is to actually test this within the project. If we can't find anything that works over the appropriate timescale, i.e. the adoption time is too long or the transition time is too long, we will produce at the end of the project a set of likely acceptable practices that could be tested. Um, policy. I'm going to finish. Yeah. Sorry, I, I have gone way too long. Policy. Uh, this is the bit I have real difficulties with. I can talk to farmers, but I don't know any policy makers. Um, I don't know how to get carabids and the things that we discover into policy. Um, I'm, carabids do have a little bit of a footprint in printing policy. For example, they're part of the um, French National Ecosystem Assessment. Carabid wheat seed predation is an ecosystem, ser ecosystem service in the French National Ecosystem Service. People use beetle banks to support carabids as agri-environment schemes in countries. There are other examples. So they do exist, but there is a need, or I think there will be a need, to provide policymakers with clear evidence of acceptable I IPM practices that have effect, resilience, willingness to pay, and support within existing frameworks. I'm terribly sorry for how long I talk. Yeah, That's yeah thank you back. very much. <laughs> um, just maybe wait a minute. Um, there must be some questions now in the audience, and uh, you were the quickest. OK, please go ahead. Uh, the microphone is one is enough. Thank you, David. Is it working? 
for, for this nice presentation. I work actually on problems related to to the crop establishment phase. Mm -hmm. So maybe you, you have got my point. I wonder, is there any risks related to an increased beetles diversity to, to, to crops I am going to sow? There are various bits of work that show that carabid beetles will actually eat seeds of crops, particularly oilseed rape. But most of those problems can be solved straight away by appropriate sowing of the oilseed rape. If you, for example, drill properly and then consolidate, the beetles don't have access to them. Most of our beetles don't really dig. So if the, the, the seed is properly presented as, at sowing, it's not normally a problem. There have been in, the, in Burgundy as well, um, recently um, some uh, examples of uh, a couple of species, one of which is Zabras of Carabid, which will actually eat the leaves of oilseed rape. But the, our, exa our, our, our findings of that, and, and Zabras can actually be a, a, a pest in the east of Europe. I think in, in, in Czech Republic, Zabras is a, is a, can be a pest. So there are some species that actually cross the boundary into being pests. But that's, yeah. Okay. But at the same time, uh, no-till no practices are expected to increase over the years. At least we, we hope, because we are talking about conservation, agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So I don't, I don't think um, carabids, genuinely, I don't think carabids ca will cause crop failures. I really, really don't. Hopefully not. Yeah. Thank you, David. I'm very interested in the, the discrete choice experiments uh -huh. and establishing those focus groups. Yeah. Presumably they are farmers that want to engage and you might regard them as early adopters um, and whether they would sort of bias potentially what actually you would get out of that. Um, that's always a problem. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I said during the talk that um, uh, farmers are solicited by lots of people to do things you know they have their own paperwork and all that kind of stuff and then we come along and say would you fill out our questionnaire um you get you always get some people who are more likely to respond than others what you have to do is you have to appropriately stratify everything so you actually understand something about your population that's in the room um i personally in burgundy where i work um, there is a big group of um, farmers who are actually um, organic farmers, bio farmers. And they're all ex-conventional farmers. And if you like, they've taken the ultimate choice to go IPM, if you like, to reduce pesticide inputs to zero. And I would really like to run this across both of those groups, the ones that are thinking about doing it and the ones who have really actually not just done it but gone a little bit further and actually see what the answers are. But that's the only way to do it. Get the largest group you possibly can, stratify it appropriately, or stratify it in such a way that you can understand some of the answers that come out. It, just to confirm, it is stratified. Yes. Okay. Next question, please. There was, okay. I guess one more, then we should go ahead. Uh, one remark. Uh, Perostichus melanarius was reported a long time ago to feed on strawberry nuts. Uh, so, but it's not important. So this can happen every time from yeah, yeah. different from different beneficial organisms. Yeah. Uh, my question is: You have presented the real field uh, situation. Mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, maybe I missed it. You mentioned uh, are the same crops planted on all these yeah. real fields, and do they have the same? adjacent vegetation because we know from studies we have done with carabid beetles to control diabrotica eggs that it's uh, a big influence which adjacent crops you have which crop you have planted on the diversity of uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the number even the density of, of carabid beetles um, there was a number of reasons why we chose 60 fields in total and that was based on the UK um, <coughs> data set that I originally um, presented from the PREA project, which is also available in this project. 60 came out as a kind of a magic number for a, a good number of fields to actually test something with carabids. The, we have four countries. Um, the countries are very different. So um, in, the, in Austria, it's actually fields from the Tyrol, which tend to be biased towards the organic end of the spectrum. 
or they're all conventional fields, but they're actually put in a matrix of organic fields as well. So that's that's something. So um, what we actually tried to do is we didn't say that we would get exactly the same landscapes in all of the countries. We didn't try to do any of that kind of control. But what we said was that um, from the, uh, the, the the literature that's out there, um, when a focal field is um, surrounded by um, pasture land by something like 20 to 80 percent we see responses so it was this kind of thing that we did we actually produced um, landscape metrics and we said that between 20 and 80 percent of uh, the landscape should be arable fields mm -hmm. this would determine our selection so we have in all countries fields that are at the 20 percent end and all f uh, and in all countries fields that are at the 80 percent end um, and the, in terms of the crop, it's winter wheat. Thank you very much, David. I guess we go ahead now and please keep your questions for the discussion later on. We will have another speech now um, about um, reducing dependence on glyphosate. It will be held by Xavier. We, we bought, we bought. So I don't know if I say that correctly. No, I know. That's rebound. <laughs> rebound? Yeah. Okay. That's when I Thank go on, the, on Google, it says rebounds when I put yeah. my name. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, th thank you, everybody. Uh, exactly one year ago, uh, there were intense discussion among Europe uh, to know whether the registration of glyphosate would be uh, uh, settled for five years or not, and so the answer was uh, yes, uh, five uh, five year registration, and then the question is uh, whether this is the last time or not within Europe, and uh, of course this depends on the capacity that we have to find um, alternatives to glyphosate, and uh, of course there are research consequences, and so my talk is about um, what we have done to analyze the situation, uh, and uh, also try to isolate what would be the, the best uh, uh, investment science should make on helping to uh, get rid of glyphosate. Um, so I'm going like the others to try to find how it works. Yeah. Everybody did that, I guess. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so yeah, yeah that, that's, maybe that's, okay. Uh, where are we? And that's the situation. Um, glyphosate has been uh, introduced uh, in many systems and uh, over the full uh, planet and the full world. We are now reaching some uh, million tons of glyphosate used every year and it's still increasing. Um, if we if we go to um, um, the glyphosate history, uh, it was uh, res registered uh, now a long time ago. Um, th then within the history of, of glyphosate, there was uh, the GMOs uh, with the Roundup Ready uh, crops uh, enabling to use the glyphosate within the crop. And uh, the patent has expired, so now um, and it's uh, available for other uh, industries, so and the price has dropped down. And at the same time, um, glyphosate resistance has evolved in some countries in, and some weed species. Um, glyphosate is used in, in different uh, situations. Um, one of the way of, of presenting that is, is in the annual crop system, uh, you, um, partition when the glyphosate is used, and it's used in uh, post-harvest to uh, um, control the weeds, uh, pre-planting the next crop. Uh, it's also used um, as a pre-emergence to um, get, um, before the emergence of the crop, um, a, a nice uh, uh, soil. And uh, it's also used uh, to desiccate um, crop uh, prior to harvest. So the timing of use of glyphosate is, is a way of, of showing this partition. Uh, in, it's not the same rule. The same rule is not um, the, the, the rule is different according to the European countries, and some will allow uh, some use and some 
will not. So there are differences among uh, European countries. Um, it's also used in uh, perennial crops, uh, so it's such as uh, grassland or orchards or, or, or vineyards. And in this case, um, it's clearly to control the weeds and uh, to um, um, minimize the development of the cover or the ground cover uh, so that um, they are um, not competing with the crop. They are avoiding, but they are still there, avoiding soil erosion and um, moisture losses. So when you, you apply glyphosate, you, of course, uh, control weed, but you also modify other things in, in the system. Um, there are other uses that have not been mentioned so far. Uh, maybe you have seen this organic Christmas uh, tree. And so I was very surprised by that because I'm not going to eat um, uh, uh, a Norway spruce. But in, in fact, it means that uh, to produce those uh, uh, trees for Christmas, uh, glyphosate is used in some conditions. And um, railway truck is also uh, using uh, a lot of glyphosate. So in France, for example, it's nearly 40 tons of glyphosate that are used over the whole country. So it's the first user of glyphosate uh, among France. Uh, so what makes the situation tricky? Well, um, it's, of course, um, as we have seen uh, already, there is an increasing volume of dependency of the system on glyphosate. Um, of course, as you use glyphosate, you will find glyphosate nearly everywhere. And so I will not translate, but in France, uh, l'épiceur a volontaire de glyphosate. OK, I will not translate that. On the other end, um, there are several other molecules that are removed from the market. And so um, it may um, increase the dependency on glyphosate. Um, the price of the glyphosate has now dropped down, so it's very, very competitive against many alternatives. And uh, there are some beneficial uh, side effects as using, uh, uh, at using glyphosate, such as uh, uh, soil tillage reduction, so that you, you can have uh, less energy, uh, less gas emission, and so on. Um, so one year ago, the French ministries asked um, to analyze the use of glyphosate, try to identify the possible alternatives, um, try to propose some accompanying measures for the transition, if there was. And uh, they didn't ask for coming back on the um, discussion about toxical and ecotoxicological <coughs> effect of glyphosate on human and environment. Uh, we were lucky in France. We had uh, started a, a survey um, where we have uh, 3,000 farms followed. And uh, so you can analyze uh, what was the glyphosate used uh, in those, by those farms when they enter into the system. So it's, I have to say that it's a, a potentially a biased uh, sample because farmers uh, agree to enter into the survey. So it means that they are probably interested to change some of their practice, especially regarding uh, their pesticide use dependency. Um, so it's among, um, uh, well, you have all kind of crops um, within this uh, uh, survey. And so we can extract information, so I, I just, put the, the two um, main situations where we have enough data. For annual crop systems, um, over more than 5,000 um, sample uh, situation we could follow, um, glyphosate is used in a, a bit more than half of the situation. Um, and uh, of course, the situation uh, varies according to the soil tillage and when they are uh, plugging and um, ma making many um, <coughs> soil uh, tillage, um, they, they, are, they are able to use very few or no glyphosate. And at the reverse, uh, when uh, they are in conservation agriculture, so that they will not use any um, soil tillage system, uh, we found in this survey and this sample that 100% of those uh, situations were depending on glyphosate. Um, for vineyards, um, so we have, of course, less point, but still we have uh, about uh, a bit more than 1,000. And the glyphosate is used in about one third of the situation, and it's spread over all the, the, the vineyard situation over France. Uh, so the question is, uh, what are doing those that are not using the glyphosate? Um, and uh, so we, we can analyze um, um, 
each, uh, each uh, alternative isolately or, or uh, in combination of, of those techniques. And uh, well, so they are using one of several of those. Um, so first of all, they are, of course, uh, controlling their weeds by physical destruction. Uh, so they are, there is a lot of mechanical weeding and surface tillage. Um, they, they want to avoid that the seeds at the surface will germinate, so the, the plugging can, can be very interesting. They, they use um, kind of intermediate uh, cover crops, and so they can uh, use uh, species that uh, will uh, freeze during winter, so that uh, the frost w during winter will destroy this uh, intermediate um, cover crop, or they can use a specific um, machinery for hashing the vegetation. Um, some of them are able to um, do the cropping under live mulch, such as lucerne. And um, of course, uh, a, a part of them uh, will uh, change the herbicide they will use, and they, they will use other registered herbicide uh, before or uh, within the, 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 the crop. And uh, um, in some cases, they are looking for tolerant varieties so that those crops can uh, um, accept more weeds. Um, as I mentioned, they, they are using these alternatives alone or in combination. Um, the aim that they all say is to maintain the pressure on weed populations. So they don't want to have uh, many weeds in their field. Um, they um, want to have a nice um, b uh, soil bed uh, before sowing. They, they use uh, those techniques also to manage uh, wines and vineyards on orchids. And um, of course, um, they are interested in uh, facilitating facilitate, uh, facilitate harvesting situations. Um, so the, the techniques they use can be, class, uh, use, well, can be uh, grouped in five major uh, things uh, that we already mentioned, the physical destruction. Um, and so this is especially uh, done during the intercropping period and uh, around the base of the vineyard, vineyards and trees in orchards. Um, the plugging uh, to ensure the burial. Um, and uh, it's, it's also uh, enabling the farmers to uh, uh, prevent emergence during the following seasons. Um, but uh, there are um, uh, side effects such as limiting the predation by insects, as, as we have seen just before. Um, they, they are really interested by winter freezing intermediate cover, cover crops, and uh, they are asking for um, um, improving the agricultural equipment for grilling the vegetation. The living mulch is, is interesting, but uh, it has um, limitation, and uh, it, it uh, doesn't control or it all, does it always control all the perennial weeds. And um, uh, well, the, the, the targeted use of all other listed herbicide um, doesn't mean that they are going to use something which is better uh, uh, in its ecological profiles than glyphosate. Uh, what we, s we saw from, from this analysis is that um, the, the market is able to change also the facilities by which the farmer is going to get rid of, of glyphosate. And this is an example with a, a bottle of wine. If, if it's uh, on a direct sale at the chateau, um, it will uh, the, the fact that um, glyphosate uh, is uh, substituted by mechanical practices, and it, it, this will make an over cost of about 20 cents per bottle of wine. And so, of course, there is no real impact, uh, because uh, you can say that your wine is produced under environmental friendly conditions. This is more or less the same uh, when the sale is at the cooperative, where the cooperative will say some of our uh, farmers are trying to get rid of glyphosate and they are uh, interested by environmental uh, conditions. And so you can also put 20 cents on the bottle and everybody will pay for that. Uh, it becomes very difficult when you are uh, selling your wine on the world market because uh, this uh, extra cost, uh, over cost, it, uh, will uh, make that you lose the market against uh, wines coming from uh, uh, South Europe or from uh, Chile and so on. Uh, so my intermediate synthesis would point those f f three, five points. First of all, uh, in France, we have farmers in any situation uh, 
not using glyphosate and they are not all uh, organic in organic farming systems but there is a huge variation uh, across France and also we can extend that over Europe uh, according to the cropping system to the soil and climate conditions and the market um, overall we find that uh, there is a majority of situation where the major breaks uh, concentrate among uh, economic impacts and working time organization and the need to buy a new machinery and uh, automation so that they can uh, have uh, fast uh, and automatic um, <coughs> actions and um, uh, the installation timing for the uh, perennial crops uh, which is uh, can be a bit tricky uh, if for example you want to use the mowing and the uh, irrigation has not been solved uh, previous to that and of course we have a situation where the it seems to be a bit more complicated, so we name them impasses, meaning that uh, the only alternative is to go back and, and do the work by hand, uh, so hand weeding, and so we consider those impasses. And so, of course, the research challenge mainly concentrate on those. Um, the, the situation differs from uh, one for, for, uh, within the, the different uh, European countries. And so we had this discussion uh, about one month ago within the NGO group uh, in Berlin. Um, and of course, uh, the aim is to find um, si uh, how we can improve situation, not only for um, conservation uh, agriculture, but for uh, conventional agriculture and also organic farming. So the situation, um, if we can improve something, should be uh, for any kind of agriculture. Just this uh, picture to show how um, the end weeding was uh, possible here in flax. And so um, you see that there were many people on the farms. So this, this situation doesn't exist anymore, uh, which means that uh, glyphosate is doing a part of the work. And uh, it's difficult to come back to such situation. And it's not the interest is not to come back to this situation. Uh, we, identify, uh, we identify a few um, impasses um, because of the choice of uh, the material to, to uh, uh, collect the, the crop. And so um, uh, sometimes it's required that there is a, an empty surface to allow a harvest on the ground. So this is the case for olive or chestnut. Uh, you have to remove sometimes uh, some particular plant because they have a disease and the uh, glyphosate is then used to uh, avoid that they, they will spread again. Uh, flax threatening uh, needs that the flax is in the field for a few weeks. And so if there are uh, good storms there and the uh, rain, uh, some weed will go through. And so it will make um, the, then uh, be very difficult to collect um, the flax. And there are other uh, situations, um, even uh, with uh, uh, toxic uh, uh, weeds in, uh, um, for conservation uh, uh, production. And uh, in many cases, the steep areas make it difficult to come back with uh, mechanical uh, control situations. Um, what, what we can um, say is that the, the, the discussion we had um, allowed to find four major things that could be helpful for farmers. Um, the first is to find a good cover crop species, and that would be uh, easy to uh, install, would be very competitive against weeds, and at the same time uh, we uh, would be easy to, to control and, and destroy. Um, there are uh, some countries where the machinery modification is, is down so that um, all the weeds going in the combined harvester are um, catch or, or destroyed. And uh, this is very useful for prophylactic measures. Um, there are people working on new cropping systems, such as uh, relay cropping, where there is no intercropping season. So the two crops are uh, put one in the other. And so the, the second crop is already here when you remove the first one. And uh, of course, there are differences among uh, the different varieties with this example here, where and there is not the same amount of weed uh, going through those two uh, wheat uh, varieties, one of them being able to avoid um, most of the weed development. 
Uh, of course, there are um, many uh, people working on how we can control with biomechanical um, machinery. And uh, some of them are um, not only um, working on how we can destroy the, remove the weeds between the rows, but also within the rows. And so this is just an example. Um, so uh, the research needs are very different, and there are several. Uh, but some of them are really relating to machinery and robotics. Um, it would be very interesting to have a better knowledge of uh, the field heterogeneity so that we can concentrate on the situations that are the worst. Uh, so imagery and, and, and drones are used for that purpose. Uh, plant breeding programs could uh, also uh, make uh, an, a focus on competitive crops and uh, new intercropping species. Um, in some cases, such as toxic uh, weeds, uh, that you raised a good example, um, there is clear attempt uh, to try to have a biocontrol agent. And new agricultural systems um, will allow to change not only the herbicide, but uh, the full system. And of course, we need uh, more references to um, see what are the extra costs for farmers and see what are the conditions for acceptance. And um, some, some last um, points uh, is about um, working on biodegradable tarpaulin. Mm, that could be useful. So here is the synthesis of what we got from this uh, general analysis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Xavier. Yeah. Um, I guess now we have lots of time for discussions, and I hope you made notes so you can ask your questions now. Um, so I saw a question before, or oh, oh there, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stefan Vetter from the Austrian Federal Ministry for uh, Sustainability and Tourism, and I'm working in the research funding unit. Um, our ministry is also funding a study on glyphosate with that topic, yep. alternatives. My question is, um, well, first of all, thank you for providing the information here. Uh, is the study available? Is there a preprint available? Um, first question. Second, how many similar studies are um, conducted throughout Europe? Do you know? anything about that so it would be fine to to close share. the loop of knowledge and share share that amongst uh, those who are dealing with and uh, re just referring to you you said you haven't had an exchange with a, a group of scientists in berlin so i guess there is something going on yep. and i just want to take home a message for my people thank you, thank you. Uh, so availability of the information your first question. Uh, so we had uh, this uh, report uh, given to the uh, French ministries. It was in French. We had only one month to produce that. Um, but it has been translated. Um, so it's not available yet. But uh, that's uh, uh, something that uh, we organize. So it's, I hope it will be soon the, the case. Um, of course, you can use this presentation and, the con and, and, and its content freely. But, um, the, but uh, there are, there's no, um, sh there is short synthesis, but there is no uh, um, article published yet uh, giving these results um, in English. But uh, most of those results have been presented in French also uh, last uh, month by the DEFI uh, um, program, where those farms uh, they, they, they make. So I have. And it's available on the, on the internet, but it's in French. Uh, so of course, there is um, a part of the information available, but uh, we will try to get it sooner so that everybody can use it. And the second point uh, was about, um, is there, are there other initiatives, uh, similar initiatives? So I think we, we, were, we are eight here that we, who were also in Berlin uh, last month. And to discuss those points, um, so we did that under the Endure 
uh, your open group. And of course, uh, the aim is to um, get uh, an update of what each country has done and try to see uh, whether we come to the same analysis. Uh, so what are the similar points and what, what are the differences? So NGO will, will do that. And of course, we want to have uh, as many countries as possible. Okay. Who is to be contacted in the French ministry? Which French ministry? Uh, there were four. Four? Agriculture, oh. okay. environment, okay. Yeah. health, and research. Yeah, oh, yeah, you told it, but I did. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Be precise. Um. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the report is, is available uh, in French yeah, yeah. Yeah, on the, on the yeah. internet. There was a question. Dave, you had a question? Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Just to follow up on this, yep. yeah, this uh, INRA report has been translated. We still have to translate figures and graph because they are images. So I don't know to what extent we can circulate the draft, but the, uh, an executive summary is available and so can be circulated now. So no problem. As yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but sure. um, it's also a message I, I wanted to convey to all of you because you said that uh, it's right within NGO, we have eight, you said eight uh, countries involved, and uh, we agreed in Berlin that uh, we would try to um, set up a kind of review papers and get the uh, same kind of information. So far, we have been, it has partly been done. Uh, in Germany, Germany has uh, invested quite a lot on this uh, glyphosate uh, alterna or alternative to glyphosate. So, so we will try to put together. So we do have an issue with statistics. It's quite difficult to get uh, good statistics on the use of uh, glyphosate, depending on country. But beyond the uh, these uh, countries already involved in danger, so it's. Uh, we, we, we miss others. So Austria, for example, is not part of NGO, so it would be nice. I don't know. Sp Spain, so there is some Spanish here. So it would be nice if you're interested to join the, uh, the team uh, that would, uh, in the coming uh, month, uh, try to, uh, yeah, to compile the information and come up with a, a statement. Oh, yeah. um, I was interested in the, um, the application on railways. It seems to me that, that that's a real, that's a problem looking for a technological solution. You, mm -hmm. you can take 30 tons straight away out of the, the national statistics if you solve that one. Mm, sure. Uh, it seems to be very difficult. That, that, that's why it was uh, considered as one of the situations mm -hmm. where there is, there is a need for trying to find uh, alternatives and because they have tried several things. Uh, you could use salt, you can use burnings, mm -hmm. but uh, you have to go very fast because uh, you have to do that during the night so that the train can use uh, the railway during the day. Yeah. And, um, and so there is no clear um, uh, possibilities, but they, they worked a lot on how to improve and reduce the quantity of glyphosate they were using. And so they already reduced by half the amount of glyphosate they were using to do that. Uh, but they are a bit uh, at the top of what they can do uh, with this uh, strategy. And um, there is no real um, reason to think that other herbicide could do the same work uh, that, that the glyphosate does because of its uh, capacity to kill a large amount of, of, of species. From the survey you presented, um, do you do you know which arable crops are mainly concerned? Uh, oh, yeah. Do do have the most troubles now because of no glyphosate? So yeah, you, we have we have all those details. I didn't present them, present them, but of course the the glyphosate is used um, between two crops, so it's always difficult to say to which crop it belongs. Does it belong to the crop that you have? Uh, done before, or is, does it belong to the crop you will do bef after? Mm -hmm. And so what we did is just to analyze what were the crop before and after, and what was the impact on the consumption of glyphosate uh, in the, in the uh, intermediate uh, timing. And uh, there are big differences about uh, um, among, uh, it changed from uh, one to two on the amount of glyphosate they use according to the situation. So some crop uh, will uh, require uh, more glyphosate and uh, the reason is uh, the timing to, uh, to get um, 
um, the possibility to, to work by machinery, to, 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 to work the soil by tillage systems. And the second is to, um, there are some crops where you need to have something very clean before, uh, and flax is a good example, for example. Are the crops like sugar beet, or do you yeah. have any ideas about it? Or uh, I don't remember the details, but they, they are sugar beet in the situation that we have followed. So, so yeah, we, of course, we have this information. Do, do you have performed the same analysis for non-professional use of glyphosate? Uh, uh, so. Uh, Yes and no. We we had uh, the we had we have tried to get uh, the information on uh, <laughs> what's the proportion of uh, agro uh, used by agriculture and, and non agricultural uh, situation, and uh, it the the ratio remains the same. So the use of glyphosate is increasing, but the, the ratio of agriculture non agricultural si situation is is, is step constant. Um, so th there are differences among countries about that because, uh, for example, in France, um, it's now forbidden to use glyphosate if you want to use that in your own garden. Um, there are um, incentives uh, so that uh, um, the, um, they will not use um, glyphosate in the same tree and so things like that. And so this is going to change quite a lot. And at the same time, they are changing their registration so that uh, some of the use of glyphosate that were uh, allowed will not be anymore allowed. So it, it, will, be, it will be modified. Mm -hmm. I suppose uh, just a question in terms of it. We're looking at very direct effects of, of loss of glyphosate, uh -huh. but maybe the indirect effects, such as, uh, I think I, coming from a pathologist side of things, sure. such as take all. So when you don't control certain weeds, it's a carryover of that, well, serial pathogen. Yep. The crop rotation is built on the capacity that we can control these diseases through crop rotation. Uh -huh. But if you have something like cutch grass or scutch grass, the control of that, mechanically, you don't actually yep. control it. Yeah, so in my first presentation, I had more slides. And uh, I, I had, uh, of course, a few slides about the uh, impact of glyphosate on the environment and the microbe in the soil and the things like that. Uh, of course, you're right, and that's a very good question. Uh, it's just not a matter of uh, reducing uh, the weeds. It's also uh, uh, how we can uh, avoid that they are within the field, um, um, pathogens uh, that will develop. And so, of course, uh, this is very important to, to know what farmers are thinking about that. And uh, so the interest of the survey is that it's real farms, and so they, they are, by the way, using also these considerations when they want to control the weeds. But of course, that's the major issue, the direct and indirect effects. Other questions in that regard? Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's more common. We also made a, a report, pan -Europe. we also made a report together with the Greens to talk about the alternative to pesticides. Sure. So it was published uh, in July this year. And what is interesting is because many of you say that it's difficult to realize what is happening at the EU level. This has a summary also talking about what is happening at EU level? Mm -hmm. So what are the different working groups in the EU where they're talking about alternatives to, to, to glyphosate or to herbicides more generally? Okay. So maybe take a look at that too. Thank you. More questions in that regard? I was just wondering, um, what is your gut feeling um, about having less glyphosate in agriculture and who's going to pay for it? So. The farmer, of course, he has to spend more in the, in the first mm -hmm. place. Um, so product prices probably have to go up. Mm -hmm. And um, do you th see a chance that this is going to happen without any other form of right, intervention? So, so, so uh, I, I avoid to speak about political uh, things about that. Uh, we were just uh, asking, uh, are there alternatives and uh, will they work? Uh, but of course, your question is a major one. Uh, so I, I, I spoke a, a bit uh, when I uh, described the situation for uh, wine, mm -hmm. where you see that it's more or less easy to uh, get the alternatives working uh, in, in those situations. Uh, well, at the end, uh, the consumer will pay. Um, we can expect that uh, after a while, like, like for other uh, change in agriculture, uh, there will be um, improvement of the technologies 
and so that uh, the, the, the pay will, the, the cost will, the extra cost will be lower and lower. Um, the, um, the, the situation seems a bit, still a bit difficult for some farmers. Yeah, so it's not, it's not homogeneous about the, so some of them will, will change. And uh, if there is enough uh, change, we, we can believe that the market will then say, uh, we are interested in non-glyphosate. Um, and so, and the, so the others will have to follow. Thank you very much. I guess we still have questions open for the previous the presentations. And um, is there anything out there? Questions for David, for example, or who else? Yes, please. You have a microphone. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would have a question to uh, the uh, decision uh, support system for managing the weeds. Uh, yeah, that's uh, very, very important and uh, useful for uh, advisors, farmers, whatever. My question is that you demonstrated the case for winter wheat and maize. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and of course, the uh, target efficacy, that's uh, the, the important question. How could you place the target efficacy uh, into a broader temporal uh, system context. I mean, more than one uh, crop, maybe two, three crop in a rotation system. So, on the same field, of course, but uh, over a longer time period. And uh, I'm not a, an, an expert in the weed uh, management. Did you use? Uh, certain uh, parameters like uh, like reproduction parameters that would somehow indicate uh, yeah the survi in addition to the survival the the population density or capacity <coughs> yeah? mm -hmm. yeah maybe i can explain it so uh, we created groups of let me say competitive crop species. So you can group uh, cereals like winter wheat and winter barley. And uh, of course, maize, we have a totally, a total different situation because maize is very sensitive against weeds. And uh, what, what we did, uh, we also uh, grouped the wheat species according to the competitive ability and uh, seed reproduction and so on. But uh, this was actually, uh, we sent around a survey uh, to, to advisors and they gave a feedback and then we created these groups. And as I mentioned, uh, the user or the advisor can change these uh, target efficacies. Mm, I have, I did it at first in the project for, for maize and I have realized that I was very risky and I said I was too risky, so the target efficacies were too low. That what we have realized rather early. And um, I think this is a process with this, uh, which is uh, still in, in work, so we have not finalized it yet. So, But as I mentioned, it's always a question with uh, the balance between safety and risk. So and and. Maybe the same for glyphosate, yeah? <laughs> Any more questions to Arndt? Yeah, well, okay, that was quick. <laughs> so it's not to Arndt, but maybe to some of the expert in weed management, because I'm not an uh, expert in this field. Um, I was wondering um, if animals play some kind of role in weed management, maybe in uh, perennial crops and not so much in the annual ones. We heard about the carabits that are feeding the seeds, but we never heard anything about sheep in the vineyards or maybe chicken or goose. I don't know. It's just a question. Who wants to address that one? Some experts on? <laughs> I have no idea. OK, yeah. Well, there is actually several examples of using grazing animals for, for controlling weeds in perennial crops, but of course you have to be sure 
that they don't eat the crop also. So, uh, <laughs> but for example, in Denmark, in uh, Christmas trees is a relatively large and uh, important production in Denmark, and they they have actually tried with sheep, and they, they actually work very very uh, well. But uh, as long as there's sufficient weeds to eat, and actually uh, Polygonum convolvulus, which is one which uh, uh, goes up into the trees, they can actually pick them up very nice, pick them out very nicely of the trees, which improves the quality of the trees. But as soon as the weeds have been eaten, they will start to eat on the Christmas trees. So you, you really have to be very careful. The other thing we have uh, tried with in Denmark is actually using geese in Christmas trees. But there we had a problem because uh, these young geese, when they, they would like to try to fly, and uh, when they st start to fly, they actually uh, hit the top of the trees. And uh, if, if that breaks the top of the tree, then you are already uh, classified very low uh, when you're going to sell your tree seven years later. So, uh, so there were some, some problems there because they also wanted some exercise, these geese. So, uh, so, but that's just a couple of examples. And there are many more examples of uh, using uh, grazing animals for weed control. Uh, our case in Hungary is that goats goats like very much the ragweed, uh, and uh, yeah, they significantly contribute. What it depends on the location because goats are not less selective than glyphosate. So as you said, <laughs> they eat what is green or whatever. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, animals um, may somehow destroyed the soil structure like uh, um, lamb or, or, or uh, goat whatsoever. So while well, one potential tool, but uh, it depends. Okay, more, yeah, there's a question over there. So for orchard we use, not goat, no way, but sheep. Uh, main, the main first problem is copper. Sheep and copper doesn't go well together. No, no. So we have to change also the uh, plant protection program. Uh, the point is that it's not for weed management. It's to mow the alley. So we have sheep. They don't go to eat apples or we take them away when the apples are ready. They have, the, they have no capacity to go up in the trees. So it's fine. <laughs> so it's used. <laughs> but it's not uh, to control the weed on the tree row. So either you accept to have a weed on the tree row, and it's also a way to, to manage it. But we know that it's still, um, so we are, we just started a survey to have an estimation of the problem to maintain a grass cover also on the tree row. We know it decreased the um, production potential, so we decreased the harvest. And that's those animals anyway, they will just maintain the, the cover low, but they will not get rid of uh, weeds. So it's not the solution, animals, to get rid of the weeds. Yeah. OK. More questions in that regard? Um, uh, oh, yeah. OK. And I have a question to you as well. There are a lot of other seed predators than carabid beetles. Um, there are birds. There are mice. There are ants. And in different places in the world, they play a big role. Um, Arguing, for example, for most of uh, Central and Northern Europe uh, that, that farmers should accept mice in their field um, to control their weeds is not a good argument to make. They don't tend to like mice. Um, so um, we've concentrated on carabids, for example, because there's a lot of information out there available to it. And um, yeah, they're, they're kind of things that, that the farmers haven't generally seen as being a problem in the past. You know, they, they kind of pass the threshold of potentially interesting if we can show that they actually do something. Yeah. I had a question to David as well. Like, coming from the mycology part of, of science, um, we know that uh, if you grow fungi from a soil solution, for example, on a petri dish, you get only a very small proportion of what's really in there. Yeah. So when you do a seed bank analysis and you have your pots and then they grow seeds, do you have an idea on, on what you get there? Yeah, so there's, there's quite a lot of work going way back to, I mean, you know, I, 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 I know of work going back to the 1920s in, in, um, at Rothamsted, for example, mm. um, where people actually did so, uh, proper seed. 
flotation of seed banks, then different seed bank uh, germination methods and comparisons and what have you. Um, the method that we've got at the moment is a modified one um, based on a, a method from the 1930s by Brenchley. Um, and it was shown to be, under certain circumstances, up to 90% efficient. I don't think we get that. I think we get somewhere between about 70 and 80% efficiency. But we're getting the vast majority of the things that are in there. Because our, our germination <coughs> method involves turning the soil over at various points in time. There is a, an extension to the method where we would subject the soil to a freezing event uh, or a, a cold snap, which can also cause some of the remaining seeds to germinate, but we don't use that. Thank you. Um, more questions, maybe in the other part of the room? I can. OK, there's one. <laughs> Heidi. I had just a, a question for the first two speakers, because uh, there was a, a discussion, a short discussion, about uh, increasing biodiversity in weeds in the, uh, uh, also through the, the pesticide management. And I was wondering whether we could uh, go a little bit further in that and use uh, allelopathic uh, interactions within the fields to, to just uh, uh, maintain the, the levels of, uh, of weeds to a threshold that is uh, not, n not agronomically harmful. And, and, and then how do you integrate that in with the other uh, predation and uh, uh, regulation services? Who wants to answer that or comment on that? Nobody. <laughs> Come on. Never mind, it was a silly question. <laughs> Something to think about in, at night. <laughs> OK, I guess um, there are no more questions. Um, we are quite early now, still have time. So, but maybe on the other hand, we, it's time to have discussions in smaller groups before we have lunch. Um, that's always a good idea. I guess you got all the little cards for lunch. And um, yeah, let, maybe let's, let's give all the speakers another hand, a final one, because it was really interesting. <laughs> and I thank you very much.